This week on Election Desk, we continue the conversation with NDC's General Secretary Aspirant Elvis Efriye Ankara. What happened to publicity and accountability that we've been hearing from the NDC? Well, we don't hear you say that anymore. What happened? No, I say it a lot. I mean, I'm talking about the NDC as a party. So, 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 so when I become General Secretary, it will be one of the major issues. You see, don't, that's what I'm saying. This country is a very funny country. It was our government under President Mahama that instituted investigations into JIDA. Mm -hmm. Is that not probity and accountability? Mm -hmm. I was the president's campaign manager. You know what that means? When a campaign manager enters behind closed doors with the, in the candidate, you know what is discussed? I was his campaign manager. And yet when issues came up, there was an open public hmm, commission of inquiry carried live on television. That is probability and accountability. Perhaps we are not talking about it enough, but going forward we'll be talking more about it. Let's talk about the man you are trying to fill his shoes. Uh, the general of all generals, General As Asiedi Nkitia. Um, what kind of person would you say he is? Do you say he is a definition of what a general secretary should be? Or there are areas where you think oh, this could have been okay or this could have been done better? Oh, I think we must give credit where it's due. Having held that position for 17 years, led us to two electoral um, victories, and of course, two defeats, I think that he has paid his dues. He's a mercurial character, um, somebody that I get along with very well. And the same way I get along with the uh, national chairman also. Yeah. I've worked with both of them very, very closely. And um, I think that there's a lot to learn from him. Uh, but we're also building an NDC for the future. So I believe in learning lessons from the future and looking at the present and forging a way forward, you know. So somebody asked me if I was going to fill his shoes. Can I fill his shoes? I said, no, I love general shoes, beautiful shoes, figuratively. That is what they did. <laughs> but I wear my own shoes. Are there areas in his reign, the 17 years of him being general secretary that, I mean, Wanting to assume that position, if you look at it, you will say, okay, these places I think that we can work on better or that place we can work on better. I think that I'm going in for a contest now. My focus is to tell the delegates what I'm going to do. I think it's a bit arrogant for a position that you're coming to seek. Somebody has been there for 17 years and you think that you know better. That is not my approach. That's think, somebody you that's are not, a deputy. That's not what I want to communicate. Yeah. What I want to communicate to the delegates is that I have been deputy general secretary before, and on many occasions when he was out of the country, I acted as general secretary, so I understand the job. I've been there before. And I have a vision, I have a track record, I have experience. The 2024 elections are not going to be that easy, the way people are making it look like, oh, We've won already. Why you homo? We near we no. I know the MPP. If you don't know the MPP, then you'll be deceiving yourself. I know them very well, and so you need somebody who is tough, who is seasoned, who understands them, who has been at the battlefront before, and who has done it with a track record. And that's where I come in. And so that's my message to the delegates. In this contest, the, um, the last count, you are contesting with about three people or four people. What's your relationship with all those you are contesting with? Oh, very good relation. I mean, Peter, for example. Peter actually was, uh, in 2012, when I was the director of elections, I appointed him, Wanda Madilo, Wisdom, Agleke, uh, Fred Agbanyo, all yeah. of them. They were working under me in my office. So we have a good relation. It's not war, you know. Fifi has been my colleague. Um, setting the record straight, we work together very closely. So. It's not uh, we're not fighting at all, but I know that um, the delegates are going to vote for me, and I'm going to win. You see, how do you think after this contest, the the NDC will come out? It will come out strong, vibrant, and ready to win power and take over the mantle of leadership of this country. I mean, 
talking about winning power, you're going to an election for the first time without the founder of the party and also a key pillar like Captain Kojo Chikata himself. What, what do you think, how does that mean? What kind of aura does it bring to the party? Is it a positive and negative? Do, are people able to tap into the energies of those people, their experience, the time they spend with the party? Or it is the case where, getting to the last days where they seem to be, have been dissociated themselves from the party, we, we are not able to fall on their energies to win an election whatsoever. Because you do recall, people have said that most of the time you do very well in an election is when you have the founder leading the charge or being part of, of, of the charge. How are you going into this election without these two key people? Yes, they are very key. And uh, a lot of times, the kinds of things they do behind the scenes, people don't know, especially Captain Chikata that I work very closely with. There are so many things that he does, and I was privileged to know a lot of it because I worked very, very closely and personally with him. And then when it comes to the founder, you know, we live in a physical and spiritual world. He founded the party. So his aura and presence, even though he's not physically present, is critical. You'll be amazed that some people have told me, oh, in my interviews, I shouldn't be talking about Rollins. You know, I said, hey, forget it. There is no way. There is no way, and I, I want to make this very clear, that I will ever uh, be in NDC and disregard all this. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It will not happen. That is dangerous. So for people who think that, oh, he's dead and gone, we should forget about him, I respectfully disagree with them. He founded the party. He's the founder of the party. I, and, and, you know, I don't hide my disagreements with him. We disagreed strongly. For example, the running mate issue with JM, we disagreed. When I felt that he was becoming too close to uh, uh, Nanado, whom he told us we shouldn't trust. He was a bad person and all that. Mm -hmm. Whoever, I mean, you told us we shouldn't like him. Now you are saying the man is a man of integrity. You can disagree with somebody, your father, but he doesn't cease to be your father. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So he's the founder of the party. And when I become general secretary, I'm going to ensure that that happens. The same way that Professor Mills, Professor Mills' legacy is not going to die. I will ensure that the name Professor Mills, his works and achievements will be strongly enshrined in the consciousness of Ghanaians and the NDC people. The same way that I've said that we have not been fair to John Mahama. Look. I have all the information here. If you go back and look at the achievements of President Mahama within three years and four months, sector by sector, and ask myself, what happened to us? Why did we allow our opponents to define us? They told a lot of lies about him. He has houses in Dubai. He has a shipyard in Japan. He has this, this, Papano. All those things were lies, fabrications. And yet, we were not able to articulate very strongly what we had done, his vision, and to defend. And that is one of the things that I'm going to look at very strongly. As General Secretary, I am going to make sure that the Rollins legacy, the Mills legacy, John Muhammad legacy, collective, this is the collective legacy of the NDC. We are going into 2024 on the basis of our legacy and our history. And I dare say that for each one of them, our legacy and record is better than the MPP any time, any day. Everyone must be proud of it. <laughs> It's a big, that is a very contentious because recently, uh, I remember when the president did, uh, addressed the nation not long ago, he gave us a litany of first things that his government have done. And I think a couple of days ago um, in the voter region, the vice president also did speak about the things, some first things they have done, including building more airports, building more roads. So I, I think the first if probably we sit down, we look at it, we speak different because the NDC cl MPP claims they have done a lot more for this country than the NDC have done since independence. I think we need another opportunity to get into that debate. But I know you're a very intelligent man and you don't believe that crap. So I haven't even spent time responding to it. <laughs> the Ghanaian people out there, they know that all those things they were saying were crap. And that is why he was hooted at. And that is why the president ran away. I was at Hubei Chucho. I was there. Okay? <laughs> it's complete crap. Uh, don't, it's a complete... I don't even want to glorify with time. 
that they can look in our faces, in the face of all that is going on, and tell us that they have achieved more than the NDC. Is it for It's hallucination. No sane, reasonable person will get into that argument. And because I'm sane and reasonable, I don't want to argue. Because it will be a total waste of my time and energy. Sebi Sebi <laughs>
the energy crisis was it not was John Mahama? Is he the one who ran in the Akosombo Dam? <laughs> I was going to say something. <laughs> no, Sebi -sebi -o. but you see, um, John Mahama himself in his VOA interview did mention the fact that the effects of COVID and the Russia Ukraine war had had an effect on Ghana's economy. That's an established fact. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, President Obama in his in, in his speech made reference to the fact that post COVID and Russia Ukraine war. Inflation has been the biggest problem of most economies in the world. That was just yesterday. Okay. Now, yes, it is okay to mention the fact that, yes, these things may not have impacted Ghana based on the politicking. But the facts of the matter is that what we are facing, because it's, Ghana is not a global village... Are you talking your own conviction or you are talking what the government is saying so that I know how to address it? No, I'm, I'm telling you what is happening in the world. Okay, I mean, good. good. In case so, I'll address you, it properly. so, what is happening around us also has something to say about what we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. I'm not to go into the politicking of what MPP and NDC want to do, but I believe that, especially when you are a government in waiting, mm -hmm. I believe it is always right to want to situate the argument in a way that the people also understand exactly where we are. Was there Russia, Ukraine? When this government, realizing that the city was collapsing, set up an economic advisory something something with 30 people, with Franklin Kujo and Co. That time was there Russia Ukraine? Was there Russia Ukraine? <laughs> so the city started performing badly long before Russia Ukraine. Now, look at the Auditor General's reports. Look at the infractions. At the time we were living office, 2016, the cumulative infractions for that year was about 957 million Ghana cities, which for us was horrible, okay? Yeah. Less than 1 billion, okay? Yeah. From that time, what are the infractions? According to Auditor General's report, not we saying it though. Yeah. That one was in Russia, Ukraine. 17 billion. 17 billion. Was it Russia, Ukraine that caused us to have these infractions? Was it Russia, Ukraine that has made us mismanage the economy? Was it Russia, Ukraine that came and made Kenneth Reata that any time we go for Eurobond, he and the minister in, of state in charge of finance benefits from those transactions such that he goes to the euro market without thinking because his company benefits. So it's a complete hogwash. This Russia, Ukraine here and then uh, it's complete hogwash. This Russia, Ukraine was there yeah. before Russia Ukraine came, all the fundamentals started going down. Indeed, the World Bank warned us, IMF, they warned us that the way we were going about collecting loans, it was unsustainable and we will get here. It wasn't Russia Ukraine that caused us to go and borrow 13 billion Ghana cities. In any case, the COVID, Ghana actually benefited because the international community felt that Ghana was on a certain trajectory and they didn't want the COVID to have a negative impact on us. So they pumped in a lot of money. Cumulatively, over 23 billion came into this economy. That should have been a turnaround for this economy. You know what they did? They chopped the money. They shared the money. Didn't you hear the vice uh, chairman saying that she alone got 1 million Ghana cities from COVID money? The real root of the problem is that in 2020, these people poured the money and bought the election. They paid people. They spent the money. That is the issue that, that is we a, must face and confront. Mr. And Mr. stop talking an about Russia Ukraine. That's an accusation every opposition party has leveled against the government in power. Okay. Since I, I started following elections in Ghana, okay. it is not new. Okay. So I don't... I, I, that is not to say it's right, but it's something that you politicians, you do. But, but why, is now, it, why is it that you are finding it very difficult to admit that the government has failed? When their own MP say they have failed? It is for the people of Ghana to decide whether the government has failed or not. My no, job no, right no, in front of no, you no, no, is, to, no, is to ask no, the questions no, and try no, to situate no, this conversation. No, 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 no. The 80 MPP MPs, they are part of the people of Ghana. They represent the people of Ghana. If 80 MPP MPs say that the finance minister and the minister of state in charge of finance should be sacked because they are incompetent and they, are, they have conflict of interest, you cannot say, who are the people of Ghana? Are they, are they from Kosomokaya? <laughs> and let me tell you, the reason why we are in this state is because a lot of media people have pampered this government. 
a lot of media people, when they started messing around, instead of media people speaking the truth to them, the media people became gatekeepers. So things that if half of it happens and the NDC, they will come out strongly, then they'll be doing, at the point they said, oh, when they talk and say, oh, we want to be, uh, what, the devil's advocate. Really? You're only a devil when it's about MPP? What devil's advocate? Facts are facts. The same way that NDC was held to account when we were in power, if half of it had been done to MPP, we won't be here today. But because they know that when they mess up, when push comes to shove, media people will be asking funny questions and trying to be doing false equivalent. NDC and MPP are the same. We can never be the same. Is it, Mr. Agra, what you are doing is what they say that when two elephants fight, it's the ground that suffers. We, the media, always become the common ground to attack because of certain things. But you see, whatever we are doing, and I speak for my media house, Whatever that we are doing with In you. any case, I'm not necessarily referring to you. Uh, of course, I know I'm, that. I'm, I talking, know you don't I'm have using business. your platform to address the generality of, course, exactly. of the I, media. I know you don't have business to yes, speak and, to my and, media. And, and, like and, and, and the listeners and viewers will know what I'm talking about. Okay, Mr. Anga. Okay. Many of your colleagues, indeed one of your uh, aspiring flag bearers, because now we, we know Dr. Dufour is running, and Mr. Mahama, the former president, have said that the coming election is going to be a do and die affair. What is the motive of NDC going to the election? Is it going to be one of violence or meeting violence with my violence? You know, it's good you ask this question. Do you know that people have actually accused us, NDC leadership, of being very soft? You know that? And what I tell them is that we, NDC, this democracy, the 1992 constitution, is part of our legacy. Whether you like it or not, this is the legacy of the NDC. And just as Solomon, when he was caught in a situation where two women came to him, and one who was not the mother of the child said, divide the child into two. The real mother said, no, don't do it. We have a heart for the country. This has been the most stable, sustainable democracy in our history. That is why President Mahama mounts the podium and says, Military, we are calling on you. Please, abide by the Constitution. It is true that things are difficult. It is true that we are in hardships. It is true that we are in difficult times, but we don't want an intervention because that is our baby. The 1992 Constitution and the constitutional era we are enjoying is our baby. So we have consistently, consistently shown that at any given time, irrespective of the provocations, we will go by the law. But that is one side. Now, if we live in a neighborhood. So if we go into an election and it's free, fair, genuine, everything, we have shown that we always accept results of elections. But you already Let don't, me finish you my don't point. trust the empire of the election. <laughs> can I make my point? <laughs> of course you can. And then you have an election that in 2008, eight people were murdered. Pin sheets were altered. Hmm? Yeah. You expect that we should keep quiet and be clapping for the electoral commissioner and the security agencies, no. So we are sending an early warning signal, and I have said it, that if they dare do what they did again, nobody will organize anything. Are you listening to me? Yes. Sir. Nobody will organize anything. The organization itself will organize. Anybody who understands my English eh, should go and check. Nobody will organize anything. The organization itself will organize that you live in a neighborhood and every time thieves have come to house number one, your house number seven, house number two, house number three, you've reported to police, you've, you, number four, number five, number six. Tell me truthfully, if you are in house number seven, what will you do? <laughs> I went to the wise is enough. <laughs> Mr. Agra, let's, let's make progress. Let's talk about parliament. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in the history of this republic, we've had uh, a member of the opposition party I don't know if he's still a member of the party. I mean, considering a lot of things that happened before. But, I mean, he's known to be a member of your party, being the Speaker of Parliament. And then we also have a hung parliament with uh, seemingly an equal number of parliament, except for a few other issues that have been going on. What do you make of what this parliament has, been, has done so far? What, what do, you think? do you think this parliament has lived to the billing, especially regarding the Speaker, the Speakership? Do you think so? No, first of all, I would, well, I'll commend our MPs for that gallant fight they put up. Um, 
in the early hours of January 6th and 7th to get as a speaker. Mm. <laughs> but I think, and so far, they've done well. But I think there's a certain, uh, perhaps want of a better word, um, the expectations are not grounded on what the realities are. You know, 137, 137 plus one independent doesn't give us the authority to be able to do a lot of things that we would otherwise have done. You know, because on the night, through fighting, through vigilance, through all kinds of means, we were able to get, it was a one-off event. But if you have 137137, stricto sensu, at any time when they equip their people in line and the independent joins them, yeah. really, you cannot have your way. So it's something that we need to educate our people. Because what I see is that because of what they did on, uh, in getting the speaker, so people think that at any given time, they can continue to do that. It's not that simple. What gives me a ray of hope is the action by the majority MPs. Well, for the first time in the history of this country, they've been able to take on the sitting president, his finance minister, call for his more. Even though, for me, that was also, there was a bit of political gimmickry in those things. Because don't forget that the NDC had already filed a motion of censure against the finance minister yeah. before they did that. Mm. But be that as it may, you also need to give them credit. Even though subsequently I've heard all kinds of stories about influence and all that, I don't have the details. But that gives me a ray of hope that when push comes to shove and the events that will get to the point where maybe there has to be a vote of no confidence or something, and if it is done as a circuit ballot, I am convinced that we will get majority members also joining, provided it's a secret ballot where they will not use the whip system to whip them in line. So going forward, there are all kinds of permutations and speculations about, you know, parliament and what they can do and not do. But I don't think that this interview will be the appropriate place to have that discussion. Okay, uh, let's wrap up on this thing. Um, I still on parliament. I have a difficulty with certain aspects of uh, a relationship between the NDC in parliament and then the NTC as a party outside. Um, Subsequent to Babin's election, uh, we've seen a number of times in certain decisions where some key f figures in the party seem to completely disagree with what the party is doing in parliament. For instance, there was an instance where I think in one of those decisions, your director of communication, Sami JP, came out and gave it to the MPs and accused them even of betraying the party's position. One of them has to do with e-levy and things. There's also been an instance where your party in, in parliament, just like this vote of censure, they start something and they never get to finish it. Do you think that, or are you convinced that the party in parliament strictly reflects the conscience of the party outside parliament, considering the fact that certain actions they've taken in parliament They've been bashed for it outside parliament by key members of your, 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 your organization. So that's why I said from the beginning that it's a function of expectation management. The person outside feels that 137, 137, you were able to get a speaker. So when it comes to e levy and other things, you should be able to throw it away. It is not that simple. First of all, you must ensure that you have all your members in parliament, which from a practical point of view doesn't really work okay so for me i think that is the communication and the engagement where there has to be clarity before the issue gets to that point we must be able to communicate clearly with our party supporters to let them know this is possible this is not possible but people actually think that oh even with our wanted several we can just do anything throw away a budget and all that it doesn't really work that way and then parliament has also its own rules and procedures, standing orders. So some of the things on the face of it may look very simple. But when you go into the standing orders, you realize that there are real challenges. And these are things that we need to educate ourselves, all of us. We are still learning. We are not a parliamentarian. Some of the things, you know, when they happen and you go and check, you then realize that, oh, it's not as simple as you thought. So going forward, that is one of the things that I'm going to look at, um, the collaboration between 
the party outside parliament and the party in parliament. But I think that generally they've done very well under the circumstances. Okay. So quick one. The first, it has to do with the... There are some members of your party previously that seems to have deserted the party based on one or two disagreements. We've had the former president's wife, Anna Kunedu Ajima Rollins, who is a very strong uh, pillar in terms of women for, for this country. Uh, we've had the, your former uh, colleague servant to the late president Mills, that is uh, Koko Anido, who also have deserted the party. And then there's also a De La Kofi and, and people that we've, we've known to be very close to the party. How is the NDC trying to bring all these people together, other than the usual communication that looks like? And then there's also the allotage cost factor, where it looks like once the people deviate a little, NDC sort of abandons them sort of trying to get them together and then declares them persona non grata constantly. Uh, how a leadership with you heading, how are you going to bring these people together? with your experience and then your connections? So I, I think I need to make something clear. The party is governed by rules. We are all bound by the rules of the party. Until those rules change, anybody who flouts them, the rules will be applied. So if you are part of the party and you flout the rules of the party, the party has to take action against you. If Subsequently, you think that you make an overture for redress, reconciliation, it will be looked at. Because a party has to be a party, a coalition of the willing, not a coalition of the unwilling. You cannot coerce or force people to do a lie. When you join the party, you know that the party has a constitution. There are rules. What you can do and what you cannot do. Yeah. My brother, me, eh? campaign coordinator. Eh? Look at what the things I went through. Public. Live camera. Three months. Did you hear me talking rubbish? <laughs> so everybody should look at me as an example. When you belong to a party, it's not everything that you should open your mouth and say. You understand me? Yes. Yes, you must, you must contain yourself. There are things that I said. You've asked me questions. I said, some of the things, when I meet delegates, those are party people who will discuss. Okay. That's why we don't hold cabinet meetings so, in public. Ms. Uh, your delegates are watching, yes. most of them. Mm. What do you have to tell your delegates? What do you have to tell your opposition, that is the MPP, in government? <laughs> this is... <laughs> so, for the delegates, uh, this is your brother and friend, Elvis Efri Ankara. Uh, you've known me, I've worked with you as Deputy General Secretary, uh, Deputy Campaign Coordinator, as Campaign Coordinator, as Deputy Minister for Local Government, Minister of Sports, Director of Elections. Uh, you know me, I welcome everybody, I don't discriminate, I talk to you always, I pick your calls, I listen to you, and I'm seeking the opportunity to become the General Secretary. The 2024 elections is going to be very tough, and you need people who understand the system, who understand the electoral system, who have the courage and the determination to face this MPP people. They are desperate, and so they will do anything under the sun. And some of us have the record, the track record, of being able to engage them and overcoming them on two different occasions. So I want to be given this opportunity so that I'll lead the party, make the party very strong and formidable. Um, when I become General Secretary, you can be assured that the party is going to be very, very solid. Uh, it is the party that will be at the center of appointments, um, just as it was some time ago when the party was very, very central in appointing people at all levels from MMDCs all the way down. The party will play a critical and crucial role and I would practice an open door policy as I used to do when I was in local government and other ministries where I was accessible to everybody. I will modernize the party, put in place systems and structures to ensure that our electoral architecture is very, very solid and uh, Believe me, when I've done it before and I can do it again, I've done it on two occasions. So when given the mandate, by the grace of God and your support, 2024 victory shall surely be ours. All too soon, we've come to the end of this exciting conversation. My guest was Mr. Elvis Efri Ankara, 
uh, General Secretary Aspirant for the NDC, the National Democratic Congress. You've heard his message, you've heard and understood what he wants to say, I believe. Hopefully, we'll meet again next time. Safi Yanka, thank you very much, and then we wish you... Thank you, thank you. Well. It's been a very... Interesting. Riveting, Riveting conversation. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, have a good day and see you next time. This is Ghana Web Election Day. My name is Edward Smith Anamali. Bye bye for now.